you to talk. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Karl von Habsburg, unuk je posljednjeg austrijskog cara Karla VI. Studirao je pravo i filozofiju. Predsjednik je pan Europskog pokreta Austrije, a politika mu je, kao i cijeloj njegovoj obitelji, velika strast. Zagovaratelj je što skorijeg proširenja Europske unije na zemlje jugoistočne Europe, kao i sveopćeg evropskog jedinstva. Od 2007. godine nosi titulu glavara obitelji Habsburg. Mr. Habsburg, first of all, I would like to thank you for this interview. Thank you very much, that's a pleasure. How do you, as a grandson of the last Austrian Emperor, Saint Karl VI, uh, see Austrian Emperor? Uh, are there any nostalgic thoughts? I think I'm generally not a nostalgic person at all. I just think being in that position, you know, you, you have to know something about history, and probably you live more conscious of what the history actually is, because of course, more or less all over Europe, I'm stumbling a little bit over the history of my family, and you have to know something about this. But is this nostalgia? No, definitely not. Uh, after World War I, uh, your uh, family had to leave Austria, your whole property was confiscated, and uh, your family was not allowed to enter Austria for several years. Uh, what do Austrians think about Habsburg family today? I mean, the family was for many years actually in exile and could not return to Austria. I mean, the first members of the family, of my immediate family, that were able to come back, this was in 1967, 1968. Uh, so that's, that's quite a long time that the family was absent. From my immediate family, I was the first one to move back into Austria and basically do, live here, do my military service here. Uh, do all the duties that you have to do and also make a political career here. So um, I think the relationship has been softened up, I would say, a lot over the time of us just also living here back in Austria. I think it's, generally speaking, it's, it's quite a good relationship and there are no more, I would say, historical resentments, which I was still feeling when I was coming back to Austria. I mean, that was still present, but I really don't feel it anymore lately. You have a large family. Uh, you have three children. You have one brother, four sisters. What uh, do they do today and what's your profession? I think actually we all lead rather normal lives. We're trying to be conscious and trying to be, of course, also interested in those, in those fields that have made part of our history, which means, you know, I always saw my family was for 800 years professional politicians. And so I think, of course, being in politics and being linked to politics is just something which is definitely in our blood and which is something that we are pursuing. And you can also see this in, in, in my siblings. I mean, you can see that uh, my youngest sister has been for many years a Swedish member of parliament. She's married in Sweden. I was a member of the European Parliament. My brother is a Hungarian ambassador, so he was uh, the Hungarian ambassador at the European Union and in different other special functions in the framework of the office of the Prime Minister or the President of Hungary. Uh, my sister, Gabriela, uh, was a, uh, an ambassador from Georgia to Berlin. So, I mean, you see, we are everywhere in Europe, actually. We are not kind of... Uh, typically uh, Austrian or a Central European family, but we are a real, I think, a real European family that have never lost those uh, links to politics, never lost, let's say, the connection to the ground, and of course also a lot, a lot of uh, social activities are also part of that. But do your children have some uh, interest uh, to politics or not? Some of your children are in some it's different... Well, I mean, my kids are still relatively young for that, and I think you want, one has to give them time. I mean, uh, I am very happy about my youngest daughter. She's still in school, but she's absolutely passionate about politics and has always uh, quoted, I mean, she's definitely going to study international relations, and she definitely wants to kind of be part of uh, the political greater field, the greater international field, and she has been accompanying me on a lot of trips, interesting trips I had to do with my work, be it in Africa or some uh, uh, Asian places. So she's very much interested in that. My son is a race car driver, so he is very, very much taken by that. But quite often by now, of course, he has to represent the family at certain occasions, also political occasions, and he's doing an extremely good job there. My eldest daughter is studying in Buenos Aires. Uh, and she's also very much interested in international politics and international relations. So I really can't complain also about my own children in this case. 
but uh, what's your profession now? You were a member of European Parliament, but you are very often in the different part of the world. My, my profession is, is twofold, I really have to say, because on one side, yes, I am linked to the media world. I have a, a little uh, radio group that I'm co-owning, which is a Dutch radio group, and we are working with radio stations in Central and Eastern Europe. Currently, we are very much engaged in the Ukraine, for example. Uh, but then on the other side, one of the uh, other strong examples are, of course, my engagement in the framework of the pan-European movement, but also my framework, my, my work in the framework of Blue Shield, which is the organization which is in charge of protecting cultural heritage during armed conflicts. But of course, that does not mean only in armed conflicts. Of course, a lot of the work has to be done before, because that's the way when you actually have to protect things. So, training seminars for military or uh, doing you know, seminars that are linked to international humanitarian law. This is very much of my work that I'm doing. Thank you for this first part. Now we'll continue some political issues and political uh, topics. Uh, the world is in a very strange uh, situation, strange uh, phase. How uh, do you define relations in the world now, in this, this period, in the last seven I mean, years? Uh, in the last seven years we have seen some very drastic changes. If seven years ago somebody would have asked, how do you perceive, what do you think the world is going to look like in seven years? I don't think anybody would have guessed that we are where we are now. I mean, especially if you're looking into Europe, I mean, with, you know, on one side, the financial crisis that had developed over, the, over these years, the uh, migration crisis, which is probably, of course, currently the biggest crisis that, that we see right now. But then if you're looking outside Europe, I mean, we are in the middle of, uh, I would say, a very interesting election campaign in the United States where we just don't know the outcome. But the one thing that the, the repercussion it definitely has upon us, and this has nothing to do with the candidates in the United States, is of course that we know from history that during an election year, the United States never are engaged in international politics. They're kind of withdrawing pretty much from politics. And so whatever happens in the world, you cannot expect the United, the United States to react to it as they normally would react to it. So anybody who wants to take harsh measures, and yes, of course, one has to mention, for example, if something rather harsh is happening in the Ukraine from the Russian side, uh, we can this year not necessarily expect a strong reaction from the American side to it. So there are also in this year, they, they, there are some rather potential dangers that we have to face and we have to deal with. You mentioned that one of the biggest problems in Europe is uh, this refugee crisis, migration crisis. Uh, what do you think is Europe well positioned uh, regarding uh, to the, that uh, issue? Well, I think Europe is in a position where they have to deal with it. There is no way around. A lot of people are still thinking that if they, I mean, not anymore, but for the last couple of years, they thought that if they close their eyes, it might just go away. And I think for anybody who was kind of really looking at international politics, it was completely clear that this would come. I remember very well studies coming out six, seven years ago that were pointing at guesstimates, I would say, of uh, refugees that Europe ha would have to deal with coming from the Middle East on one side and coming from Africa on the other side. And the amounts were, if I remember well, somewhere in the range of 12 million that we would have to guess to come to Europe in the next, uh, at that time they said 15 years, which means until, uh, until the year 25. So we are still at the beginning of this movement. We, we are not even you know, in the middle of it, we are, we are at the beginning of it. And still I don't really see a proper preparation from the European side to it. There would be quite a couple of measures that would be absolutely necessary to be taken. And the first measure would be to create a European harmonization about it. Because if, you have, if the treatment is so different, then the treatment is right now when you consider what refugees have to expect when they are in Germany or when they are in Sweden or when they are in, in Croatia or in Greece. So the, the, the first step that would be necessary now envisaging what is going to come to us in the next couple of years would be to really create a European harmonization before taking the next step, which people have been talking very often as the first step, which I cr consider absolutely wrong, which uh, creating contingencies. So if you create basically contingencies for individual countries, you can only then do this when you have done the step of harmonization. But uh, harmonization is not only regarding this refugee crisis and these topics. What do you think that there is also other problems in all other levels in the European Union? Do you think that uh, European institutions are too much bureaucratic? You know, 
we are always, so many people are talking about an over bureaucratization of the European Union. I truly don't see it in that strong way. Every bureaucracy is too big, we know that. I mean, so that's just a, a general statement, so is the European one. But it's not as bad as we usually think. The problem of the European bureaucracy is, first of all, it is sitting far away. So it is very easy, if something does not work at home, you don't say, it's my fault, I have to fix something. No, it's the fault of Brussels. So it's very easy to kind of point finger at somebody who is far away, who is not going to defend himself. What people always forget is that the so-called overwhelming Brussels bureaucracy is much smaller than we usually think. Because I mean, if you take the language service out of the bureaucracy, the, the actual bureaucracy is substantially smaller than the bureaucracy of some of the big cities within Europe. So it's really not that big. And Europe is, if you want to look for something, a very transparent institution. So that should not lead us to the conclusion that automatically that works, because of course, we have substantial institutional problems within the European Union. We have some institutions that work fairly well, and we have other institutions that do not work at all, because what they are lacking is sometimes the European spirit. And I think this is the biggest problem that we are having today in Europe. We see, of course, on one side that there are certain national movements coming up again. We have just seen recently in the elections in Germany how that could have a very strong impact, also on a regional level. But then on the other side, uh, a lot of member countries are driving a renationalization of Europe. And that is just profoundly wrong. And that reflects on the institutions. So when I'm looking at the institutions and see that we have a directly elected parliament that is working actually in a very European sense very well. And we have actually a fairly good commission that is working very well, let's say, in a sense as a European government. But then we have an institution like the council. And the council is an institution that is only acting in the interest of the nation state and not in a European interest. But then on the other side, trying to draw all the powers to it. And it has a lot of powers. We have to kind of be realistic about that. Then we see a certain imbalance here. Uh, in this context, how do you see an announced referendum in the United Kingdom about staying or leaving? Uh, do you? I would not dare to make a prediction of the outcome, but my feeling is that uh, the, the vote, the referendum in Great Britain is going to stay, that Great Britain will stay within the European Union. I would just think that the consequences for Great Britain would be drastic if they're stepping out. Uh, the consequences for Europe itself would be unpleasant. They would not be terminal or, or terminally difficult, but, but they, would be, they would be unpleasant. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I just have the feeling also when I am in the United Kingdom and I speak to my British friends, I always have, get a little bit the feeling that they think, you know what, we make the referendum and hopefully it goes in a way that we are leaving because that gives us a new position to renegotiate our uh, position within Europe. And that's one point where I'm just trying to kind of warn them again and again and say, you're, you're wrong. If you're out, you're out. And if you look at the European institutions, if you look there, some people in there that are still have certain leadership qualities, if I'm thinking about Mr. Schulz as the President of Parliament, or uh, if I'm looking at some other of the representatives that have some standing, for them it is clear, if Great Britain is out, it is out. It has to kind of you know, re-establish the, uh, the entire situation. They will not be in a situation where they have the cake and eat it too. And that's what Great Britain feels itself in, like that they want to cre create a situation where they want the best of both worlds. But that just, I don't think, is going to work. And that's why I personally also think that there is a certain understanding for that in Great Britain. And that's why I personally believe that the referendum will probably, with a small margin, go in a way that Great Britain is staying in the European Union. Uh, you are the president of Pan-European Movement in Austria, the organization within the International Pan-European Union, which work on uh, European unity since uh, 1922. Uh, how do you see countries in Southeast Europe within the context of European integration and the uh, members of NATO? First of all, as somebody who is traveling a lot, also outside Europe, um, I am always struggling with the perception people have of Europe. Because, for example, if you go to the United States or if you go somewhere to Africa and people are talking about Europe, they actually mean the European Union. And I'm always trying to explain, wait a second, that Europe is much bigger than just the European Union. There are quite a couple of countries that should be part of the European Union and should be part of the European Union relatively soon, hopefully. Um, but Europe is bigger than just the Union. 
So in this case, I just think it's very important if the European Union is more or less taking the position where they <clears throat> put themselves in a position where they want to represent Europe, the integration process has also to continue in a sensible way. We have a mechanism that, again, is a relatively transparent mechanism for accession to the European Union. We just have currently a very, very strong opposition of many countries within the European Union against any type of enlargement. Because they're just saying we have so many institutional problems and we have to solve institutional problems first before we even think about enlargement. I think the argument is profoundly wrong. I think you cannot join these two problems. Yes, we have institutional problems and we have to solve them. But then on the other side, we have to work on the enlargement process if we really want to be Europe. So for me, an important question is, what is the starting point to think about Europe? What is Europe? I mean, so many people today see Europe only as, an, as a zone of economically wealthy, more or less wealthy countries, which I am sure was not the basic idea of how Europe was created, especially, I mean, we're not talking now after the first war, but especially when, let's say, the European community was started after the second war. Because it was something that came, it was an idea, it was a recognition that came out of that terrible second world war, that they said we have to create a united Europe also as a basis for security and stability in Europe. And if that's one of the basis I'm thinking about Europe, I have to see that I have to integrate as many European countries as possible. And that is for me the outlook we should be taking in the direction of Southeast Europe. We should be monitoring, of course, completely close because the mechanism is very clear and the negotiations are very clear with the countries of Southeast Europe on how to integrate them. But we should not use some fake political argument to stop the process of enlargement of the European Union. One of the special countries in this region is Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, that uh, submitted a membership uh, application for the UAE on the 15th of the February. And, uh, but uh, we can hear that uh, after this submission, in some circle, diplomatic circle, we can hear there is, that this application it wouldn't be accepted and that uh, it uh, is not credible. What do you think about it? I personally was very glad when I heard that Bosnia-Herzegovina has basically submitted uh, its a starting position to join the European Union because, I mean, this is just one further step in the process. On the other side, of course, I can see within the European Union that there are lots of people that, especially in the political field, that are standing on the brakes and say, we don't want to deal with enlargement, we don't want to deal with problems probably that other countries have and bring them into the European Union. Um, I think that's very short-sighted because actually what the Union is, is amongst all the other elements it has, and if we are talking about the freedoms of the European Union, and if we're talking about the economic situation of the European Union, it is a platform for stability and security for its members. And the more we can broaden that, the better and the more important it is. Uh, your late uh, father, Archiduke, uh, Archiduke Otto von Hausdorff, was a great uh, advocate of unified Europe. As a member for European Parliament, also as the president of the International Pan-European Union, uh, he especially advocated uh, independence of international recognition of Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and those he was uh, declared as honorary citizens of Sarajevo. Uh, your father would, was really a great visionary. Uh, are we lacking visionaries today? I think we have a couple of visionaries. What we are lacking today, in a really frightening way, is leadership. Um, I think in a situation of crisis, you need a certain amount of leadership. I think we have established the fact that over the last couple of years, Europe has kind of moved into an area of crisis, but we are completely lacking any European leadership. And that is a serious problem that we are currently having. Nobody is taking the helm. So you cannot just blame everything on Germany and say, OK, this is the richest country of Europe and therefore Mrs. Merkel should be on the helm. That is just asked for too much. We, we need, we need some, some qualified leadership. But of course, leadership also incorporates the fact that somebody must have a vision of where he wants to go, not tomorrow or day after tomorrow, but where he actually wants to be in a couple of years' time. But how far is modern Europe from, from the pan-European ideas? Well, I think the, the pan-European ideas are of a Europe which is really 
based also particularly on European values. And that's a complicated thing because Europe is an extremely diversified continent. There is no doubt about that. But I think we have, you know, there are quite a couple of established values, which also you can find in most constitutions, which you can find actually incorporated in most countries. And what the Pan-European Union is particularly doing is on one side, of course, pushing the unity of Europe, but then on the other side saying, you know, if we just have a skeleton of something, it doesn't work. There has to be kind of, you know, flesh and muscles to it that actually operate it and brains to it. We are, of course, dreaming logically, and you have to dream in order to have that vision of kind of a much more perfected Europe. That is something the realist in us knows very well that we will never achieve it, but we want to get as close to it as possible. So yes, we are always away from, let's say, what we consider an ideal Europe, but that should not bother us at all. It's the thriving to get there, which is the most important thing. And so the, the pan-European concept is, of course, a concept where we are talking about, you know, kind of a, a healthy society, a European society that is truly European, that uh, works under the principle of subsidiarity, which I think is one of the most important structural principles, which actually is also based in the Maastricht Treaty as being one of the base principles of the European Union. So that's just something we have to work and thrive on. One of the uh, very important uh, issues in pan-European ideas is the position of the, of the men. Uh, did the capital take uh, center place uh, of mankind and subordinated all interest to that? I think a big problem if we relate this to the European Union is the fact that many people that are active today in the Union in decisive positions only have the view of an economic union. They do not see the Union as I think the founders have really seen it. They do not see the Union as a collaboration of states and people as a a European platform for stability and security, as a European platform for liberty, as a European platform where individuals can really thrive, where, where a healthy society can live, they have very much lost that scope for the sake of economy. And economy is of course not everything. You, economy is always, it's a tool. And that's what very many people for, it's a problem of our time that very many people confund tools and, uh, and values. So they, 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 they confront these two things. When it comes, for example, to the example of the European Union, this is a classical case where a tool, which is the economy, is mistaken for what the society actually is. Who will be a better candidate for American president of, if they, they uh, win in these uh, pre-elections? Trump or Clinton? The thing is, I, I, really, I really don't know. I, to be honest, I don't like any of the two candidates. Uh, I think they would both be, um, I don't want to judge them for how they are for the United States. Because of course, as a European, I'm looking at those candidates on how would they reflect on Europe, on the politics we're having here, or how would they actually act on the international uh, stage. I mean, Clinton has proven in her position uh, that she, she knows probably a bit more about international politics than Donald Trump does, but I don't particularly like the way how she handles politics. Uh, Donald Trump has not proven anything in politics, so I really don't know, and I'm still hoping, probably in vain, that we might see some other candidates coming up. But we really don't know who or what the next president is going to be like. And I really don't dare to make any predictions here. And uh, on the end of this interview, just one short, uh, uh, your opinion about Vladimir Putin and rule of Russia in this uh, actually world. If I'm looking today at Russia, um, I see, of course, on one side, a logical partner we should be having from Europe because they are our neighbors, they are a great power, we have to deal with them, but they are currently under an extremely problematic leadership. I mean, we have seen the military actions that were done by Russia, especially in the Ukraine, the aggression that was happening there, the occupation of the Crimea, uh, the, the military action uh, in the Donbas region. These are just signs that make me really frightened because they show a politic which is profoundly un-European, one has to say, which is hegemonistic, which is aggressive. And if you talk to Russian politicians, and you will find very much, again, this old, typically Soviet concept 
of the so-called near abroad, where basically they are saying, we have our area of influence and we are not ac accepting anybody else in this area of influence to exert any influence. And that's the point where I have to say, listen, we have been coming a long time since the conflict between the two big blocks, Warsaw Pact and NATO. So uh, the Soviet Union was breaking down and there were very good reasons why it was completely collapsing. There were lots of states that were suddenly emerging and those states had the possibility to adhere themselves to a concept, which was either the concept of a Western free market economy or to a Russian hegemonial concept. And surprise, surprise, those countries decided to tend towards the Western free market economy. And that's just something, if we are saying that the principles that we are accepting, which is basically a free market economy, which are democratic principles, I also have to respect the decisions of those countries. And of course, I'm also expecting Russia to accept those decisions that those countries had taken and not just take the old hegemonial way and just uh, exert the power that they were exerting during the time of the Soviet Union. So currently, I consider the Russian situation as something very dangerous. Mr. Habzo, thank you for being guest of Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you.